Hello YouTube, today we'll be going over some mechatronics, uh, specifically bond graphs, state variables, and making uh, the equation in matrix form. Uh, so if you're watching this video, this toolbox, I'm going to call it, should be very familiar to you. You already understand how to formate, uh, excuse me, formulate bond graphs. You know what zero and one junctions are, you know what gyrators are, you know what transformers are, you know what effort and source flows are, you know about derivative causality, and you know about how flow and effort are related for the zero and one junctions respectively. So this is a uh, more difficult problem um, that should kind of get your gears going, get you some extra practice uh, to kind of test your knowledge already, and this video serves as a guide uh, through the problem um, that's a little bit more advanced than your basic problem that you might be familiar with. So let's take a look at this example here. Uh, for time purposes, the bond graph is already given for you, um, and the gyrator equation is shown um, as E uh, in the box there. Uh, so the first thing we're going to need to do, well, the question asks, it says, from this bond graph model, um, we're going to add causality and write the state equations assuming all the elements are linear, and then convert the state equations and write them in matrix form. So let's start with assigning causality. Now, I would suggest when doing any type of these problems is to have create your own toolbox. This is one I came up with really quick that shows the causality um, for inertia, capacitance, and resistance components, and transformers, gyrators, and all that stuff. So you know exactly what to look for in terms of what is the uh, integral causality, and the respective equations. So, first thing, as you already know, when you're starting a bond graph and you already have it created, you use the effort sources or the flow sources to assign causality, and those are defined as follows, where the effort is away from the source. Uh, you kind of think of that causality as a hand pushing effort, and the flow would be coming into the effort source as an input, effort is the output. Okay, then we continue. We say, okay, we're kind of stuck here, so let's go to the right side and look at that inertia component. Well, we know the integral causality is where the causal stroke is towards the I component, and we also know that um, at all one junctions, the uh, causal strokes should all be at the one except for one away. Since we have one away, that means this one is um, toward, and gyrators behave in this causality fashion. Same thing, the one junction has all the causal strokes towards uh, the, the port except for one, and that would be uh, the two, which I forgot to add. Um, and then you would assign integral causality for the I component. Uh, there's, there's the two part. And then the result um, for the zero junction would give you uh, a causality towards the R. Okay, now that we have all that, oops, now that we have all that, we're, the first part was we did the causality. Now we're going to write the state equations. Uh, now this takes some practice, so hopefully you've already done some already, but this will kind of walk you through uh, deriving state equations for this problem in particular. So when deriving state equations, you have two, you need to write your equations in terms of two things, state variables and your inputs. So the state variables um, are shown from the I and the C components on a bond graph. And if you have I components, your state variables are momentum, which is P, um, remember, p is equal to mv, and for our state variables for c, you would have q, and q is a uh, representative of displacement, the general variable for that. So since, notice how we have two i components here and no c's, that means both of our state variables are going to be in terms of p, and we can write them as p3 and p7, based on the numbering here. Now the inputs, what are the inputs? What are we applying to the system? Well, we have two effort sources on the far left and the far right, um, and we'll just call those E1 and E8. Now when we're deriving state equations, we need to make sure that our variables, or our equation is, is in terms of these variables only, state variables and inputs. So let's take a look at the derivative of momentum, so P3 dot. Um, so you know by using this chart over here, that for zero junctions, effort is uh, common, and for one junctions, flow is common. And the antithesis would just be the sums. So, oops, excuse me. All right, so 
we need to write p3 dot and p7 dot. Those are our two state equations that we're going to need. And the state equations are dependent on the number of state variables. Since we have two state variables, we have two state equations, which are simply the derivative of the state variables. Uh, whoop, you didn't see that. Um, okay, so now let's take a look at p3 dot. So p3 dot, if you follow uh, the portion next to the i component in the upper left corner of the bond graph, you say, okay, momentum is a function, or is, is related to uh, force or effort in this case. And at a zero junction, we know that all the efforts is the same. So effort 4 is equal to effort 3 is equal to effort 2. So uh, that's how we got those. So those are all equivalent. And we need to make sure we write P3 in terms of P7, S1, and or E1 and E8. So we just need to kind of move ourselves through the causal strokes there. So we're at E2 right now. So let's move from E2. We're like, okay, well, E2 at a 1 junction uh, is defined as the sum of the efforts at one point. So we have flow coming in from the, or excuse me, effort coming in from the effort source at one, and we have effort leaving at e at five. So we'd subtract it because notice E2 is going away from the junction. So what's coming in is positive, what's leaving is negative when the arrow is pointing away from the one junction. Okay, we're like, great, we already have E1 in our equation, that's exactly what we want. Now E5 is not in, uh, in terms of a state variable or input, so let's keep going. So E5 is given and is related by a gyrator equation, which is given here. Um, you can figure that out from the mechanics or the electrical properties or uh, hydraulic properties uh, given by the system, but they're given for us now. So E5 can be written as RF6, and flow at a one junction is common, so that means F6 equals F7 equals F8. Um, so we'll just say it's equal to F7, and F7 for I, for I port, notice on this equation here, we have at the top left there, F is equal to 1 over I times P. Okay, so we're like, wait a minute, 1 over I times P, okay, let's just uh, put that there. So 1 over I times P7, right? And then we have the R there because F7 ha had a coefficient R from the gyrator to show common flow. Boom, we got our first state equation. Nice. All right, let's write that over here as a little summary. So we have our first state equation. Now we need to find P7. Okay, let's find P7. So P7 dot um, is, is related to effort again. So we're like, okay, let's look at P7. We know that it would is going to be the sum of the efforts at the one junction, so we have E6 plus E8, and look, E8 is in terms of a state variable, Oops, excuse me, is in terms of a, um, sorry, input, not state variable, and now let's figure out what E6 is, because E6 might be a little complicated. Well, uh, we know E6 is related to RF5, given by the gyrator equation, and we can relate our F5, we can look at the flow at the one junction, and the flow at the one junctions are all common. So that means we can say it's equal to F2. So um, that means F2 can be rewritten as a zero junction as the sum of F3 and F4. Notice how the flow at F2 is going into the zero junction, and F3 and F4 flows are coming out of the zero junction, so the two have to sum up together to give you F2. So F2 is equal to F3 plus F4. And we said, okay, let's write F3 and F4 out. We can go back to our toolbox here, and we say, okay, uh, we have our I and our R, and we can write our flows as 1 over I times P and 1 over R times E, respectively. So let's write that out. Like, okay, we got E6 is equal to P over I3, which is the I component, now we're going to do the resistor component, which is E4 over R4. Like, wait a minute, you think you're done, but no, E4 is not an input. So we can't do that, we have to, we have to rewrite E4. So we're going to separate this again, and we're going to write E4 separately. Uh, like, okay, let's figure out what E4 is. Well, E4 is equal to E2, because there is common effort at a zero junction, 
and we say, okay, let's keep following through with that. Well, E2 at, at a one or effort at a one junction is not common, so it's the sum of them. So we could say, okay, that's the sum of effort one minus effort five, since the effort is leaving from the one junction at that point. You could follow the okay. Big note: the signs, like if you're figuring out if it's plus or minus effort or plus or minus flow, is determined by the arrows, not the causal strokes, not what's in red but the arrows and which way they're going. The causal strokes, which are the red lines on the bond graph, are what help you determine the equations. Um, so causal strokes help you determine the equations. The arrows on the bond graph uh, determine the sign of the effort or flow, depending on what you're looking for. Okay, now that's, a, that's aside, let's figure out what E5 is. Well, didn't we kind of figure it out earlier? Oh, no, wait, look, E5 is related in terms of RF6, right, from the gyrator. Say, okay, but we already figured out what F6 was up there. Look at F. Uh, look at P3 dot, and the second line there, we have E1 minus RF6, and we said F6 is equal to P7 over I7 based on the equation there. And we're like, okay, we can already write E5 then in terms of um, P7 over R7 times R. Okay, so now... We can write the full E6, um, and we can say, well, we have R times uh, P3 over I3, which is the second line there, and then we have plus E4 over R4, and we just figured out what E4 is, right? So E4, um, well, let's put the 1 over R4 first, and then we're going to put E4, uh, which is E1 minus E5, and E5 we just said is R minus, or uh, R P7 over I7. Cool. All right, so we have our final state equation. Now I'm going to rewrite E6 plus I8, and I'm just going to distribute all the coefficients. It's a little messy, but I'm just going to do that for you. I'd recommend uh, you doing that on your own. Take your time there. And now we have our two state equations, right? So now we're asked to put it in matrix form. And matrix form um, in, is in is this example right here. So x dot is equal to matrix A times x plus matrix B times U. And x and U are vectors. Um, so we can say, okay, we have our state variables on the left side of the equation are equal to some matrix, um, which will be the coefficients, times our x's, which in this case are our state variables. So that's P3 and P7. And then we have plus the coefficients of our inputs. And we have two inputs in this case. So we're going to have... Um, the matrix look like this, E1 over E8. Now to find the coefficients, we already have the state equations, we just got to write it in matrix form, so look at P3. So P3, are there, are there any, or look at P3 dot, are there any P3 terms in that equation? No, so we put a big zero. Okay, are there any P7 terms in that equation? Yes, the coefficient in front of P7 would be negative R over I7, right? Good. Okay, now let's look at the second state equation. Uh, so we have P7 dot. Are there any, is there a P3 term? Yes. R over I3, right? The coefficient in front of P3. Is there a coefficient in front of, well, first off, is there a P7 term? Yes. There shouldn't be a dot there. I just realized there's a dot there. P7 dot in the state equation is not correct. It's just a P7. Um, I'll erase that in the end. Um, so, like, okay, yes, there is a coefficient. Negative R squared over R4 times I7. Just a coefficient, right? Like, okay. Now, what about the inputs? Were there any inputs in the state equation for P3 dot and P7 dot? Well, in the first one, we did have an uh, E1 there that was an input, so yes, that was a coefficient of 1 in front of it. Was there an E8 component? No, so we put a 0 there. And then, let's look at E1 and E8 in the second equation. Was there an E1 component? Was there an input component in P7 dot? Yes, and the coefficient in front of that is R over R4. And then, yes, we also have the E8 component, which has a coefficient of 1, so we just put a 1 there. All right, and uh, let's erase that little mistake here. Doo -doo -doo. There we go. All right, that wasn't a dot. So there you go. That is how you derive um, the state equations by knowing your state variables, your inputs, and putting them in matrix form. A more... Uh, to see what you would do after this, you ha would have to solve for the solutions and maybe find a transfer function. Um, and this is just the first step in analysis of a bond graph, which is a very powerful tool. Uh, this is like one of my favorite classes in engineering, and I really hope that you all got uh, 
learned a thing or two by getting some extra practice um, on a more difficult problem. And I hope this video helped you, and I wish you best in your studies. Good, good luck, and happy studying.